thank you, and thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to speak. So, well, to throw away two minutes after, which is be quick so you can all get to have wine. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the talk will be about functionality of link homology, so it's roughly the three parts what, why, and how. So, first part will be what, what kind of link homologies am I talking about? What do I mean with functionality? Second part, why do we care about any of this? And the third part will be, well, how do we get there, which will be very, very rough. So, let's start with the first one. So, what other things I'm going to talk about? So, we start with link in R3. So, let's say we have something like <coughs> this embedded in R3, and we want to associate to this some invariant, and of course, one of the most classical ones would be the Jones polynomial, a long time ago. And the link homologies I want to talk about, the first one, is its categorification. So, final homology. So, we go set up where we have a link and we send it to some homology of a complex of graded vector space or Y modules, depending on what you do. So, there we go, if I bring my one of roughly 2000. And of course, you get that by taking graded Euler characteristics, so keeping the internal degree and collapsing the homological one by setting minus one into that variable. So this is the first type of link module I want to talk about. If you think of this as um, as the Jones frame as being some invariant coming from, let's say, the ticket drive invariants, this would be the SL2 case with fundamental representations. So then there are, of course, from that set of obvious generalizations. So some of these will be the other ones I want to talk about. So the first is roughly JL corresponds via which you take and derive invariance to taking SL2 and V. The standard representation, of course, really everything quantized, but I'll let the lazy so always just write the Lee algebra and the representation. So, of course, with the usual setup, you bring this into some generic form, and then cups, caps, or evaluation, co evaluation of that whole algebra. <coughs> the crossing, one of the two you choose will be the R matrix, the other will be the inverse, all those things. Then, of course, you can. Generalize this to, let's say, SLM, and corresponding there's a co corresponding homology. So this I will denote by KR upper n, so one of the Zansky homology, or I'll just denote by SLN homology in the following, which will then categorify the corresponding polynomial given by that which you can derive invariant, and you can also generalize. from V to, let's say, fundamental representations. So in other words, for each component of your link, you choose a fundamental representation, and then you do the whole procedure. And this I will denote by the same symbol, but in reality, this will not be an invariant of links, but colored links, so we choose some fundamental representation of each, and this will call colored for one of the Zansky homologies. So these are the homologies I want to talk about. So this explains the last bit. So now I want to tell you what is this functionality I'm going to talk about, because a priori, well, if you just look at this picture, there's no obvious point where to talk about functionality. It should be a category somewhere. <coughs> so what is the, the corresponding category you want to look at? So of course, if we have, let's say, L and L prime two links, Well, if we just look at the Jones polynomial, there isn't much we can do to compare the two. I mean, it's two polynomials up to substituting variables, there isn't much you can do. We can't really compare J of L and J of L prime, so there's nothing there. But of course, if we go to homology, there's an obvious notation. We can look for, since these were a complex of graded vector spaces, we still have a graded vector space, we can look at homogeneous maps. So, of course, for this thing and as well, of course, always when I write this, the same question will always be for KRN as well. 
here we can ask for the existence of homogeneous maps. Between two homologies, but of course that makes the right hand side, of course, into naturally a category, great vector space plus maps. But what on the left hand side? What should correspond between two links to this map? So there we need some notion of cobordism. So what we want to look at is the following category, and I'll be very sloppy while writing it down. So the objects should be links in R3. In reality, it should really be embeddings into R3, but we don't worry about these things. Now and what should be my morphisms? My morphisms should be, well, of course, if we want to look at something as a link, as a boundary, it should be something two-dimensional. If we try to glue something two-dimensional between two links and then R3, it will be hard to do without intersecting each other, so we just go one dimension higher. So our morphisms should be link cobordisms in R3 times the interval. Of course, that we can do in that one, then we can just look at honest, smooth, two-dimensional manifolds with the links and its boundaries, and there's no problem there. And of course, we look at these up to isotopy and all those usual things. As I said, I would be sloppy there. And then we can, of course, ask whether we can extend the construction of these link homologies to a honest functor from this category to the category of graded vector spaces or graded bimodules. and homogeneous maps. And the existence or the questions of the existence of this map, that's what we would call functor reality, the question of functor reality. So the existence of this extension is what we call functor reality. So let's start with a slight history of that question. Of course, it began roughly 2000 with original one of the question if we can extend that. So, of course, the first results were in that direction. So, so the history of the question. So, the first one, so for n equal to 2, for one of the results, we will agree with one of. So, let's say for the n equal to 2 case, the first two results are that this is not possible in the naive way. So the first two are by Jacobson in O4, respectively, by Martin in O5. This nearly works with the original construction of one of the modules up to a sign. So it really works. So then, of course, the idea is okay. If signs are a problem, we might have to modify the construction a bit, add in some additional signs to make uh, this work, and of course keep the construction that in the on the link we get the same homology. So this was done in different ways. So by Powell, Clark Morrison Walker, and by Moshe. So they each fix the problem of signs in different ways. One could say the first two by just adding in some additional combinatorial structure onto the cobordisms. The last one by really modifying the TQFT that lies behind everything. So, and, uh, so they modify the construction. Still, they get the same homology group, so that nothing changed there. So the objects, you still get the same images. So you modify the construction and obtain functor reality. So this for n equal to 2, so of course the next step would be n equal to 3. So the methods that Clark, Morris and Walker used, you can also adapt to n equal to 3 in some sense. So Clark In 09, it's a shop that it's also possible to do for n equal to 3. And the uh, top part, then the next step, which would be general n, which would be 
experience with this. Joined, well, first with someone who doesn't want to be named because he's an organizer, and Paul, saying that colored Polano Kosansky homology for SLN is factorial. Why do we care about this? So, <coughs> at what level does this sign problem come in? I mean, that you don't get a chain map, or yes, or, yes, okay. that if I'm, I mean, you get a chain map, but somehow, if you compose in different ways, you sometimes get a sign ambiguity. I mean, you, you compose some, you can take a group of two coordinates, you map to some maps, you get one possibility, you compose them before it's coordinate, you map them more than. Uh, you get a different sign from them. Uh, so it's really just that. You okay. get, after composing, you get two maps that are nearly the same up to a scale. Mm -hmm. Up to an overall scalar? Or? No, no, that, uh, yes. that depends on the corresponding situation. I see. Okay. So, I mean, these modifications they do, they're not trivial. They really are involved to get the signs in there. Um, one remark for this theorem. You don't really have to go to the homology, you can also look at the complexes, that will already be, a, be an invariant and would be functorial. And um, you could also extend this to not links but tangles, but we'll stick to the case of links because it's just simpler to write down all the things that follow. So let's go to the why. So why are we interested in any of this? So of course there are two things where you can ask why. The first one would be the most naive question, why you can go from the Jones polynomial to the to a one homology. But I guess uh, at a conference about clay verification we don't have to discuss this. Except of course for the Aussie answer that uh, at least for one wasn't born in New Zealand. But so we only discuss why functoriality <coughs> might be of any interest. So why why the interest in functoriality? In a priori, it doesn't look like uh, it have much applications. So I'll be very vague and just mention a few things where this is useful or has been useful in the past. So for example, functoriality of the original Hovano homology was used to show that Hovano homology can see real topological invariants, for example, uh, Rasmussen showed the Milner conjecture purely combinatorial by using this homology theory. It's a function that this can be used or was used. To show that it really show sees some real topological invariants and not uh, just these quantum invariants like uh, Richard Teague derived invariants. Another point why it might be useful is if you look at some ideas how to construct form manifold invariants, then functionality for a link invariant is a quite important step there. It's slightly cheating because what they really need there would be the functionality in S3 times the interval. So that's that is just a one additional point, but it's a huge step there. So if you would have functionality. S3 times the interval instead of R3, then this is a basic building block of a four manifold invariant. <coughs> but even if you don't. Yes? Yes. Yes. 
And um, even if you don't have functionality in S3 or just R3, you can still try to somehow do the opposite. You can try to disprove, of course, various conjectures about four manifolds, but just well taking four manifolds where you don't need the full functionality in S3. So that was try, for example, but at this point, usually failed until now, in most cases, because you only had for one homology to play with, but perhaps it's not possible to use some of the others to do it. So this should somehow convince you why the why this functional equation might be of any interest. So let's go to the third part, the how part. So there. What's the difference between functional reality in S3 versus functional reality in R3? Well, the thing is, what you do check is you pretty much what you get is you get a, in some way, a generator relations construction of this category. And, you, and if you have put R3 replaced by F3, you get more relations which you have to check, and some of these tend to not be local. So it's a lot harder to check relations in S3 than in R3. So I mean, what you could somehow say, if you have R3, you want to make some modification of your link, that's somehow not too bad. But if you go to F3, you can pull it once around the whole sphere. And that's hard to control, like the very naive version. But otherwise, if you want to have more detail, the expert sits right next to you. <laughs> What, what, what? Do you expect it's functional? Honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> I would hope so, but since uh, the step from the R3 to F3 is totally non local, I can't tell you if it is or not. And even for a while of modules, this is still open, so no idea. So if you want to compute this module, there are different ways to do, the, to do this in a, let's say, categorical framework. You can, uh, if you want to construct the SLN module, you can do it by matrix factorizations. You can use, if you take the categorification and skew how reality approach, you can do it by basically KLR, thick and KLR calculus. But the problem is that uh, all of these constructions that are algebraic, so they are relatively rigid, you can't somehow well, you can't rotate a matrix factorization a bit in space or stuff like that. So you have to have some more uh, topological category in mind where you can construct this homology group from. And that, hopefully, is more adaptable to well, tiny modifications like link homologies. So, let's go to the how, which will be a very rough sketch. So I said what we want to do is we want to construct some category in which we can well, construct the link homology that is of some topological nature. And the keyword here is it's a phone category. So I will explain a bit how this category is defined and then which features go into it that it's possible to calculate anything at the end. Because you will see that the category itself, it doesn't look like a priori that it's useful for anything because it's relatively complicated. And then at the end I will explain a bit why it might be possible. So, <coughs> let's first construct a category. I'll call it p form or pre form star. So the star is for that it's kind of a free thing. We will model some relations at the end. So, what should this be? So, objects of this should be closed webs. So that's something that should remind some of you of uh, categorified skew how approaches. It has something to do with the representation theory of UQ, SLN, or stuff like that. So the objects should be closed webs. So what are these? So these should be finite, oriented, labeled in Z strictly larger than zero with labels, graphs embedded in a disk. D. So you can of course take other kind of surface here, but we'll just stick to a disk now. Um, and they should satisfy 
certain flow relations. But instead of defining that, let me just tell you how locally these graphs should look like. e.g. locally, we take a piece of our graph up to isotopy, there are only three possibilities how a neighborhood of a certain point in the graph should look like. If our neighborhood is such a way that we only hit one edge, then it should only be a straight edge with some label A. If we have more than one edge, then it has to be a tribal vertex, nothing else might, may appear. And flow condition means, okay, these two are A and B, then this bottom one that goes in should be A plus B. And of course the inverse in some sense should also be true. So if we have A and B going into the vertex, then A plus B should go out of the vertex. E.g. an example for something like that. We have here our disk. Let's say we have here something with label 4. <coughs> and then we have here label 3 and 1. That would be an example of a closed graph. As I said, uh, you should think of something like skew all duality. So this is maps between uh, fundamental representations of some SLN and pretty big. And these are exactly your generated morphisms. The multiplication and the co-multiplication maps between the exterior algebra. So that's really where they come from. So these are objects. They are just the closed version that don't hit the boundary because we're just looking at links, not at tangles. So the obvious generalization would be to have graphs that also meet the boundary. That would then give you the corresponding thing for tangles. <coughs> So what are the morphisms? So <coughs> so the morphisms should be what I named foams. So these should be some versions of cobordisms, co just a bit more generalized. In other words, they should be various controlled versions of two-dimensional CW complexes. So what should be foams? So a foam from, let's say, V to W. So these should be two closed webs, each embedded into a disk. What is this? So a priori, this is a compact two-dimensional CW complex with finitely many cells. And we want that these cells are oriented. Um, and it should be embedded in two well, if you just think like the cobordisms, we have some disk at the bottom, some disk at the top, just put a cylinder in between, and that's where the cobordism should go into. So the same here. The CW complex should be embedded into this times an interval. So of course it has to satisfy some conditions to at least have anything to do with B and W, and then we make some restrictions on what type of CW complex should be allowed. So such that. So the first one, of course, since it should go from B to W, the bottom boundary of F, so F intersect with D times zero, should be the web V, and the other one should be the web W. So F intersected with this should be V and F intersected with this should be W, that's somehow clear from being a morphism. That also already tells us how we might be able to concatenate these because since we know the boundary will coincide with the boundary of the next one, we can just glue these things together. So we already have an idea of how to compose morphisms. But we don't want to have everything here, we want to have some more restrictions. Namely, how neighborhoods of interior points on these two-dimensional complex can look like. And pretty much we distinguish whether a point lives on a zero, one, or two-dimensional cell. And it's corresponding to where it is, it should have a prescribed neighborhood in some sense, up to, of course, isotopy. That's everything here is up to isotopy. So 
So integral points of f have an angular component form. So if the point lies in a zero cell, now let's say start with the easiest or the two cell. So if the point lies in a two cell, well then its neighbor should just be an open disk. So we always find somewhere in neighborhood where it's just the little point. So the dot should always be the point, and just its neighbor is just an open disk. And one thing in additionally, which we can say here, well since the the boundary with 0 and 1 should be a web. Remember, the edges were labeled, so it makes sense to also label the two cells here. Because, of course, their label should, in, should coincide with the label the corresponding one cell in their boundary. So that's something we want to have. So this one also carries a label. So the two cells will be labeled by the same set as the one cells of the corresponding objects. Then, on the one cell, they should pretty much look like the identity above one of these special tribal vertices pieces. So they should look like what we have here are one cell with the point on it, and then we have always three two-dimensional facets meeting there. So, and if these two are labeled A and B, then this is A plus B. So how do we decide which one is A and B? Well, remember, everything is oriented. So these two should have an orientation that induces the orientation of this one-dimensional piece, and this one is again exactly the opposite. So that's a technical rule, but always have to remember there is some orientation that somehow tells you where the labels should be. And then the most annoying one is on the zero cell, because basically the zero cell is there to give you associativity of the maps between the ones we have down there. So pretty much what that means is we have something like this at the top. and something like this at the bottom. So of course labeled A, B, C, and then they correspond to the bit with the very right A plus B plus C, and so on. And then there should be a prescribed form in the middle that should somewhere include a zero vertex. So how should that thing look like? So we have here our zero vertex sitting in the middle, and it should be connected to four one-dimensional cells. Two of them pointing inward into the point two pointing outwards. And if you really look at it, at this point there will also be a bunch of two cells that hit each other. There are four that are very obvious. The four that sit exactly below these facets. And then there are two that come from in here and from here. So there are in total six two-dimensional cells that meet at that point. So let's say this is C, B, A. And this is something like A plus B, B plus C. So here around this point, there are four one cells and six two cells. And what I don't write in, of course, again, the orientators will tell you which ones will have A plus B on them, which ones have A and B. So of course, since this thing is just up to isotopy, well, it's not easy to imagine, but something like this will always be in there, you know, very complicated forms. But this is the only neighborhood that is allowed for a zero cell, nothing else. And as I said, this should just detect and remind you of the corresponding associativity conditions for these maps. So these should be objects and morphisms. And as I said, uh, the composition is just gluing. So does this also imply that if I intersect the form with B times zero, that this will be contained in the one skeleton? Uh, no, no. 
Um, yes, so in reality, one has to be a bit careful here, yes, I was sloppy. So um, there are no one cells that lie on the bottom. It's really just two cells that really have a one dimension intersection, and the one cell will have a zero dimension intersection, just the tribal vertices. And there are no zero dimensional vertices. Well, that's already clear because of the boundary condition, uh, the neighbor condition, but they are never on the bottom. But so I can, for instance, have if this is the bottom, a two cell which goes like this. Not if then your boundary is a one cell that would hit the, bo the bottom. So your one cell, they meet the bottom or top in a zero cell. It's like saying every stratum is transverse to the boundary. That's a good way to put it, yes. Mm -hmm. Except for the, the zero cell. Well, I guess it be yeah, they just because of this neighbor condition never hit it anymore. So and this composition is blue. So this should be our basic category with which to start with. So this is our category of uh, let's call it preforms. And now we want to modify it a bit. So step two will be to leave basically the object and the morphisms as they were, more or less, but uh, somehow make the gluing procedure more complicated, namely by introducing something that's well known from presentation theory. So we want to upgrade this preform star. Preform star, and what do we do? Well, the first thing is we allow linear combinations of morphisms, so Z linear combinations. So we linearize it over that Z, and then we take the additive closure of the whole thing. So we allow direct sums of objects and corresponding matrices of morphisms. So linearize over Z and take additive closure. Yes. Yeah, so we allow formal direct sums and matrices of morphisms. And why do we want to do that? As I said, to modify the composition, the gluing procedure. So how do we do that? Well, so each two-dimensional cell of a morphism was labeled by an A. So what we can do is we can attach an additional data to that two cell. So to each two cell of label, let's say A, we attach a partition of up to A parts. Let's say alpha with at most a parts, and I'll write this as alpha being inside of P of A. So P of A is not partitions of A, but partitions with up to a parts. So what should that remind oneself of? This is very close to uh, the partitions that would allow, for example, for a Grassman variety for a very, very big. Of any number with up to A parts. Okay. So I don't I don't yet um, say what the maximum sum of the size of the parts is. That's not yet restricted at all. Just the number of parts is at the moment restricted. So you mean a set of numbers with at most A elements? Exactly. Just ordered decreasing. Yes. So the, what you asked is the some of the, let's say, the size of the various pieces of these will be restricted soon, but not yet. So at the moment, they are just some partition, of some natural number, up to eight parts. And instead of some of naive viewing, we want to do the following. So let's say we would normally do in some procedure, two facets or two two cells with label A together. So here in the middle, there would be somewhere where an edge would have label A, and we want to glue them together. So now they come equipped with two partitions of up to A parts. So what is a partition of up to A parts? Um, well, that's also a weight for GLA. 
So that's exactly what we model our multiplication rule. So we go over all other partitions with up to eight parts. So dominant weights for GLA. And then we use the little bit richer than coefficients. And the corresponding multiplication rule, or the tensor product rule, for GLA. And of course this we do locally, locally, and then extend linear to the whole thing. That's the first bit where in some sense some more representation theory comes in. But until now, the N for SLN homology didn't play any role. So now we stick the N in, in some sense. So you have to, so when you move it away, you have to do this along every edge. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Along every edge, and then of course take the corresponding by the distributive law about overall things. Mm -hmm. Yes. So of course, if your form gets complicated, this will be a huge uncontrollable sum, basically. So, but if you don't fix the maximum number that you're partitioning, that must be an infinite sum. Hmm? What? If you don't fix the maximum number you're partitioning, that must be an infinite sum. No. Alpha and beta no. have some finite size. I mean, alpha and beta are some partitions of A. They have a fixed size. I don't know what, what size it is, but they have some fixed size. Which means I take those two irreducible representations for GLA, take the tensor product, and then I just look at the irreducible sums. That's a finite set. And those partitions will also have up to eight parts, and those I plug in there. That's it. It's exactly the tensor product rule for GLA, which is definitely very finite. So let's say, I mean, if, uh, if A and B, let's say A has 15 parts, that has size 15, and beta has size 17, then I will look, because of the little Richardson rule, I will look at all partitions with exactly size 32 that have also A parts. But I don't want to write them down. I can't. So, step three will be add in the end and also add in something that's called equivariance. So we add in N and let's be a sloppy and say it make it GLN equivariant. So what do we mean by that? So the first thing we do is we extend scalars. from z to symmetric functions in n variables, or in other words, the GLN equivariant homology of a point. So in that sense, we extend just scalars, and now comes somehow the magic ingredient. about which I will say nothing because there are two talks this week that will talk about that. So the magic ingredient is a single TQFT functor. Let's call it F from so let's call this category where we've extended scalars from star n from this one to sim n modules, which is due to Robert and Wagner. So since they will talk about this, I will not go into any details. So they constructed this functor, and they will talk about this week. So there's some nice functor from this category just to sim n modules. This construction is well, quite involved and difficult, so as I said, I won't go into any details here. But what it allows you is, since this is a well-defined functor, it allows you to just model the kernel of a functor. 
And this will be the relations we want to use. <coughs> and this really is just on each home space, we mod out the kernel of that home space. So we leave the objects as they are and just, just mod it out on each home space. So, so this is the category we're interested in. Yeah, so this is our form category. Where does it depend on the end? Hmm? Does it depend on the end? Oh yes, of course. The end that was on the right side is of course still there. You can think of this as the subcategory of uh, no, I wouldn't really think of it as a subcategory. No, I really would just think of this as pretty much you. I mean, your your space of morphs are pretty just formal linear combinations. You just now impose different uh, different relations on these morphs and spaces. So you just model some relations. Some of this function just gives you a coherent way to do this on all possible home spaces. If you do it naively, you just run into trouble. So since you have a TPFT function, you can just model it out on each home space. So just somehow as a way of uh, encoding all possible quotients that you have there at once. The kernel of linears are things that get mapped to zero modules. No, no, no it's not, it does not on objects. Yeah, objects are just totally preserved. Oh. Kernels just on morphism spaces. On yes. So let's see. So what do we do next? Is the, is the F conservative? Okay. Conservative, I have no idea. Okay. No idea. So step four is, well, we now have this category, now we somehow get from links back to this category. So, so of course, let's say if we do it, For links in R3, what we should end up with is some object in this category, but mm, object doesn't work, so we need to go to complexes. So what we'll end up is an object in the category of complexes over this phone category. Um, I won't write down the exact thing what you do, but it's similar to what these brackets usually do. If you take a crossing, you map it to a relatively easily defined complex, and then you tensor all of these together, or in this case, you glue all of these together. So it gives you a huge complex in the end. And of course, you do it in such a way that if you want to do the SLN homology of a link, this will be, in this case, You take the bracket of this link, this will give you some complex. Then you take the functor to sim n. You have a functor of sim n complex, or complex of sim n modules. You can specialize this at zero. You have a polynomial ring in n variables. You kill all the variables and set them to zero. Alternatively, you can work with the next varying version of this homology, but you can also just set everything to zero. And then take naive homology of this complex homology of the complex. I mean, this is a technical step, because you have to write down all the complex and all the different pieces. It's quite messy. Um, 
this thing alone wouldn't just be an invariant, but if you uh, go to the last decaying, that would already be an invariant, for example. Then, of course. Sorry, th doesn't this F, by definition, sort of kill all the morphisms of the bracket L? Like, bracket L is, by definition, the kernel of F, right? I like no, no, it's, it system. lives in that category, not the kernel of F. Ah, okay, yeah. So One of right. those. I mean, it could, of course, be zero by yeah. coincidence, but you know, hopefully, in general, not. Otherwise, this was a very empty homology theory in the start. But since there are examples where this is non trivial, no, it's not. And then it would be factorial. Yeah, then it would also be very factorial. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> Even over S3. And this program is just empty. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm? This program is just an additive category. Or exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's an additive category. So, of course, then one needs to extend this to the whole category. links plus link cobordisms, that gets even messier because as I said, you basically need to have a description of your link cobordism by generators and relations, relations being something called movie moves, and you have to then associate various canonical complex and chain maps to all of these things. So again, a technical statement, it works, one can do that. But the problem is, of course, if we now start with some link or two links, we get a huge complex that we can't really control because even if we even if you put in here something like a simple crossing, you already get a complex of pretty much length, one of the labels more or less, or the difference between the two largest labels. So it gets relatively big, and especially, of course, the whole complex gets more or less uncontrolled and large. So it's somehow a way to push down all these complexes and make them small enough to be able to calculate anything. Is this double bracket given by an explicit formula? Yes, yes, more or less, yes. <laughs> the thing is, for a crossing, it's an explicit formula, and then you glue all of these things together. Yes. You have to check all of these, but some of these are relatively simple by definition already. So I don't want to write down all the forms and so all the because I mean that's the problem. I mean, all the morphisms are of course forms. So you have to write some well three-dimensional things into your morphism spaces. So but many of these are by definition already give you a nice differential and everything. So they're not that bad. How much how much imagination is failing me? How do I take the link and turn it to a trivalent graph? I mean, what, how do I get trivalent vertices from a link? Um, so basically what you do is, so let's see, what can we do? So if we, if we take something like, let's say, So we only just define it locally. So we have this piece mm -hmm. of a link. Mm -hmm. Then we we'll just say what it gets mapped to. So let's say this is A and B. So then this starts with the following piece of the complex. So we have here A, here B. So let's say we have here case B, A. Then we go to the one where we first some of flow one over here, and then a minus b minus one over there, and then so on all the way. So this will be a complex of the next one. Let's just write it down. Will be the first flow one over here, and then a minus b plus one over here. And <coughs> so on until we pretty much flow everything at the first step, and nothing at the last step. What were a and b to begin with? A and b are just two labels. Because these are the late, I mean, these are the, are in the webs. Sorry. So, I mean, this is a piece of the web. So, so this is just a uh, link. Uh, uh, so, and they were colored by some fundamental mm -hmm. representation. They are just labels A and B. Uh, okay. Positive numbers, and that's what you map it to. And this complex goes on roughly until B minus A parts. But this is just for the crossing. If you have a knot, and there's just a single number, A and B are always equal, if it's a knot. Um, if it's not there, of course, equal. Then it's just one component. Yes. Yes. If it's a link and those two things come from different components, they could a priori be different. I mean, this is just somewhere in a link diagram. So in a link, so if A and B are on the same component, they need to be equal. Okay. And the over crop, 
uh, overstrand is where the this edge starts. Is this some other point? Yes. Okay. And then, of course, you also need for the cup and the cap some canonical things, yeah. but yeah. these are concentrated in one degree, yeah. and then so on. You need to do all of this together. But what's very obvious is that this is more than an uncontrollable complex, and it's huge. So it's, to com compute it, it's, well, hard. So you need some way to reduce it in complexity. So, what's the next step? Well, the next step pretty much follows what Vanatan did. We check that this whole construction, even though it's more complicated than his, but his proof still works that this is functional up to scalars. This still works, his old idea. So you still can check the same way, more or less, that this is functorial up to scalars. And they are really in C, not at some end. So really in the base field. So that you can still do with the same strategy as Barnatan and O5. And now you have to somehow come up with something to make it simpler. And the idea is, well, we went to equivariant cohomology, so we cannot only specialize to zero. We can only spe also specialize to other points. And there are points which take the GLN equivariant cohomology, or for example, a point, or also other things, to a same simple ring. So and, uh, for this, so we let this be a set of n distinct, n uh, distinct numbers in C. And then, of course, we can evaluate these and specialize everything at these numbers. So this gives us an evaluation from sum n to C, and correspondingly, just applying it to everything in the form category, the corresponding specialization of the form category. So now, why is this in some way helpful? Well, just as an easy example, what for example comes up, if we look at this functor and look at it at this web, this is a prior allowed, just a circle with A, this would be mapped to the GLN equivalent cohomology of Grassmanians of eight planes in CN. And if you specialize at n distinct complex numbers, this turns into a semi-simple ring. And what that means is, morally speaking, that's what I want to stop with the whole thing, is that you can control eigenpotents for this category, because you can easily control eigenpotents for all of these rings. So you can control eigenpotents and split off the whole complex into nice small pieces. And what you then check is, well, if a relation holds here up to scalars, well, if the relation doesn't just turn to zero, it holds here with the same scale. So you can check the scalar if you find here a specialization where it's not zero the relation. So you exactly do that. You find a specialization for each relation, you need to check where this bit of the complex is not zero, and there you can calculate the relation because the piece you split off, they get very small. They somehow, well, this one start with a huge complex, you somehow get into a very simple linear complex that you can split off. So it's something we call simple resolution, which look very, very easy <coughs> in the end. So you can really then calculate by hand in each case that all of these scalars turn out to be one in the end. And I think now it's time for one. Any questions? Oh, you mean on the set of endpoints? Yes, I mean, on those set of yeah. No, I never thought of that, honestly. But, no, never really. No. Why did you introduce the partitions on the two cells? Um, well, they really go into these pieces. I mean, these are the basis for this ring. They are partitions of up to A parts and up to N minus A rows. So is there an interaction between the GLN action in step three and those partitions? Yes, they are hidden in the function. So I left it to the okay. next speakers to explain that. Now that's really hidden in the function that uh, those who are not totally disjoint, it's really 
you have your, uh, normally you would have just these partition as your uh, base of the cohomology, but since you use GLN, you also have this sim and base field. But you can either choose them more or less independent, but you can also mix these in some symmetric functions, you get mixed bases, and these are also used. So it's some of, in the common choice, you can either keep them apart or mix them. And that is important for the whole thing, because it, it comes into the pairing on the whole problem yourself. <coughs> Do you have any statement about uh, uh, foamy carboxyls when you when you do the you put uh, the foams between the three mix, right? Yes. You expect something some variety for this kind of carboxyls? I mean, I wouldn't say expect because I have no idea if it is really possible or not. No, I mean, could be, but never thought of that. So that's a wild guess for me. More questions? So is there some uh, uh, a priori definition of this foam category that you gave this definition that was very sort of topological and drawing these pictures? Is there, in, by thinking about brush mines or something, some way to define some category more naturally? I think the original category, <laughs> I mean, the original category, not really, I mean, the, where I said you can mock out with a TQFT functor. I think there's a way to do that geometrically, but uh -huh. I'm not good enough in geometry to do that. Uh -huh. So it might be possible, but I've, I can't fix any of the details on the end. So the whole, the category itself, I don't think there's a more natural way. That's not a judgment, I'm just asking. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I, I totally agree that it looks, it looks in the construction way, sure. Yeah. No, but, no. <laughs> Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.